con nuestra segunda expositora, Melissa Yurkoy. I will switch to English, so I will talk about Melissa so she can understand what I say. <laughs> Melissa has worked in the tech industry for over 20 years in roles ranging from junior software engineer to her current role as the chief customer experience officer at Adaption. She holds a bachelor's in computer science from the University of New Hampshire an executive certification in management and leadership from MIT and a SAFE program consultant SPC4 certification. Always driven by her passion to have a positive impact on the, of, on the decline of women in STEM education and careers, she has volunteered with organizations around the world, including Chick Tech Everwise, YTI, NH Tech Alliance, Microsoft DigiGirls, WiseHer and AnitaP.org. This passion has led her to co-find Diversity Thinking, an initiative focused on moving inclusion from conversation to action. Melissa organizes mentoring programs and creates opportunities for collaboration among diverse thinkers through her Rise and Diversity event series. Welcome, Melissa. We're so happy to have you here on 8 8.8. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I'm just going to share my screen really quick to make sure you guys can all see this. I'm really excited to be here. Um, as Lisa mentioned, um, Melissa Jerkois, a co-founder of Diversify Thinking, that initiative she described, as well as the CXO Adaptation. Adaptation is a startup here in the U.S. in the Northeast. Um, so really excited to be here to talk to you all today about a little bit of the, what I call like the human side of technology. I think um, we as technologists love the bright and shiny objects that we get all the time and, and new revelations in technology. Um, but we often forget about the people that are consuming it as well as um, the team that makes up um, our own organizations that allow us to have such great innovation. So I wanna spend some time talking to you today about why I have seen in my own experience, why we at Diversify Thinking and also my own experience in startups have seen a, a great, uh, outcome from having diversity across the team and why that's important. Um, I, I know here I say it's crucial to startup success. I'm sure some of you with us today maybe don't come from a startup background. And I'm here to tell you, apply it to your own context. Um, a team within a larger corporation, for example, um, a team that you're just starting, some sort of grassroots initiative that you're building within your own company as sort of an entre entrepreneur, um, any kind of context that you're in, I promise you that there are things that you're going to take away from my talk today that you're going to be able to apply. Um, and it could be advice that you share to other leadership um, representatives. So I also love to say that you can lead from any chair. So don't think as you're listening to me, oh, Melissa, this is great, but I'm not a C-level executive or I'm not a director. Or I don't have a team. I'm not a manager. I promise you um, part of inclusion is making sure that everyone has a voice. So you have a voice regardless of where you sit. And again, like lead from any chair. I'm a big proponent of that. So I want to dive right in and start to talk about, you know, where do you start? I mean, diversity is a pretty huge topic. Um, it can be really, really overwhelming. I think it is for quite a few people, leaders and otherwise. Um, and because it can be overwhelming, we often get a little bit um, paralyzed by it and we're not sure where to start. So I'm here to tell you it's really simple. Step one is the simplest step. It's really defining what diversity is in your context. Um, you know, there's there's lots of articles out there, and I've read one just this morning, actually, where the de facto standard for diversity and where our minds ultimately go 90% of the time is gender and race. Um, and there's a reason why. Um, we certainly have a lot of work to be done in those particular er areas, but I want to challenge your thought today, again, um, to think differently about diversity. There's a lot of what we call here at Diversify Thinking dimensions of diversity, and we explore those um, through some of the events that we've held, um, like she mentioned during my intro, but also just conversations and programs that we put together. And when I say different dimensions of diversity, what I'm talking about here is think beyond race and gender. Think beyond what you can even see. Um, so there's there's the neurodiverse, you know? So, you know, people with autism, for example, that's a that's an element of diversity. Um, people that have other sort of mental illness or even like differences mentally, that's an element of diversity. Um, age is a big one. Uh, age ageism is also a big thing in our society um, worldwide, right? So I think just really challenge to think about not just gender and race, but all these different dimensions, and then. Think about what that means to you. So there's great initiatives out there, and I really obviously support them for, for clear reasons as being a, a female in the tech industry. 
Um, a great one is you know, we're going to be gender diverse 50 50 by 2025. I've heard this quite a bit, and that's a, an amazing goal to have. Um, and I support it again, as I said. Now, that's one definition of diversity, and that might be where you're headed. That might be as an organization, you look across where you're at and you understand your gaps and you make a definition of your goals and diversity to be meaningful to you. And that's what I mean by in your context, because maybe gender diversity is a huge gap that you have. Um, maybe you're a very male dominated team, organization, et cetera, and you want to change that. I applaud you recognizing that as the first step and defining that, but just make sure you understand and you all are aligned around what that means. And this sounds really simple, but write it down. Um, just like a mission statement as you would for your company or the vision and goals, and that's how you set your roadmap. Um, you don't know what your destination is, then you're not going to get there. Um, so set clear expectations around what the destination is. If it's 50-50 by 2025, or if it's something around ethnic diversity, um, or personality diversity or background diversity, whatever it is for you, just be really super clear, define it, write it down, because now you're going to have the destination that you're headed towards. And, and that's, again, the very first step. And that's how you sort of overcome some of the overwhelm is you identify those things and define them. And why is it important to define it? Because I can't get directions to get to a destination if I don't know where I'm going. So if I don't know that the most important thing to me is gender, then I won't know what steps I need to take to build an action plan to get there. So that's why I'm saying the first, first and most crucial steps in this journey is to define what diversity means in your context. And again, there's not a wrong or right answer. We often get like that paralysis around feeling like, well, we have to encompass race. We have to encompass age. We have to encompass religion economic status, any of these things, there is no have to. There is what is important to you as you, in your current context and what is the gap and why? Why is it important? Like, that's what I want you to define. And, you know, I often say, once you define that, let it be your superpower. This is really, really crucial in the startup world um, because you can leverage that for so many different aspects, which we'll talk about a little bit more in just a second. But I do say that, you know, and not just in just, but let it be your superpower. There's so many great benefits of having a diverse team. Um, it can actually propel you forward. So define it first understand what it is you're trying to achieve, where your gaps are, what does diversity mean to you for your current team context, whatever that is for you. Again, I challenge you if you're not in a startup today, these words still matter. Um, and again, like do that first. So now you've got a clear definition. You know what diversity is for you. You understand that it's important. What do you do next? Um, well, and when do you start? Right now. <laughs> And again, defining it is that first step. But, um, you know, a lot of us as technologists, uh, of course, um, in cybersecurity and other fields, I'm sure that we've heard the term technical debt. Um, I love this parallel because I, at being, you know, an engineer for many years, experienced both um, maybe implementing what was technical debt as well as suffering through it on the other side of that when I was in product management um, and not being able to promote things on a roadmap because of technical debt, because it would be too expensive because of things that we didn't fix previously. Um, there's lots of good reasons to do that, right? So I think um, technical debt is, we think of it as like a bad bad thing, a naughty word or whatever, but really it's it's a an happenstance that happens because we have deadlines that we have to meet and we have to make sacrifices um, sometimes in order to do that. And that's sometimes what emerges from that is technical debt, right? We make some hard decisions. Um, it's not that different in diversity. So I love this parallel of, and this is true, right? People have this diversity debt, which just means um, when you make those tough decisions to not implement a program, because this needs to be something that's an official program and part of your business strategy. But when you make a decision not to do that because you're growing so fast and you don't have time and you don't know where to start and all of those you know, overwhelm reasons, you will accrue diversity debt. Um, so there's no better time to start um, than, of course, yesterday, but, but here you are. Um, I often say like, like well-established companies have a lot larger challenge with this. Um, why is that? Because they didn't start early. Um, they didn't start on day one. And like we at Diversify Thinking have this model where we want to help leaders of any organization of any size, but we like to focus on startups because we believe those are the, the companies of our future. We want to help them on day one start to implement even the thought around this, like defining what it means to you and what your goals are. Because if you don't, 
you're going to get so, um, I guess your team's going to get so large that it's hard to dial back from that. Um, and it's, it's hard to look across and say, oh, geez, now we are a homogeneous group of people. How do we implement diversity now? Um, so it's a lot easier when you're a smaller team. It's a lot easier to think about it as part of like the ground foundation of your business. So that's why we are we really kind of harp on not accruing diversity debt because it is something that happens unfortunately really fast. I mean, just like technical debt, before you know it, you, you're kind of sitting on top of a pile of it. And we all know, I know I have suffered this as well. You don't really go back and fix it um, because it's expensive. So there is an investment in doing this, but the investment is actually greater if you wait. So diversity debt can also have dollar signs associated to it. So certainly starting on the first day and thinking about it um, makes a huge, huge difference. So you know what it is. You know when you need to start, which is immediately. Where do you start? And, and like, how do you do that? And why does it matter? Um, so we always say start at the top, right? So your why, because your leadership team for many reasons, um, your leadership team is what represents your company to the outside world. Um, that's through speaking engagements like me here talking to you today. Um, it's sort of all the marketing messaging, all the um, interactions with customers in the market. You know, and if your leadership team is homogeneous um, and you don't rep have represents of representatives of the identity of your customers, they're not going to relate to you. So there's a business impact there, right? A huge business impact. Um, and so, you know, I think we need to recognize that this has an impact and we have a way to get around this. So, you know, it, it's, it's interesting because... Um, you know, 65%, what is this number? You know, why why does this matter? And it really is around, you know, the the way that leadership is diversified across startups today. So, you know, there's a direct correlation to the diversity of leadership and the performance and direction of your, your company, your organization, your roadmap, and it does set the tone for that. So, so I challenge you to really think about that, start from the top. Um, there's a lot of data that has showed that um, an ethnic diverse founding group will outperform all white founders by 30%. So that means a lot to people that are investing in your company. So 30%, 30% is not something to balk at, right? That's not like 0.5%. There's a lot of dollar signs associated to that. 43% um, of companies with diverse boards have higher profits. So the leadership and the advisory of your organizations really does have an impact on this. Um, you know, founders have two times more likely to get an investment if they have gender diverse founding teams. So that's around gender, right? I mentioned there was a lot of different dimensions of diversity. Um, 2.6 times more if it's led by women and then this one's this one's something that really really um, makes me smile. Three times more likely to get invested in if there's a female CEO. Now, what does that mean? Do not go hire a female CEO or go recruit a female female CEO just because I told you it was you're three times more likely to get funding. That is not how I want you to approach this. That's not the next action step. I want you to approach this because I want you to understand and build diversity into the thought process you have around planning your leadership team, acquiring leadership team, and, and thinking through that. But I don't want you to tokenize it, right? So I don't want to see level role as, as a female executive um, to be tokenized. I want it because I am the right person for the job and I have the right level of experience and qualities that you're looking for, right? So... We see people, I, I like to call this box, check, box checkers. Don't be a box checker, right? Don't don't let diversity be a thing that you check off a list. Okay, I've got a female CEO, moving on. Like you need to be really serious about it. You need to be committed to it and you need to ingrain it into your culture and just the way that you think. So, and it does have a dramatic business impact. I mean, that's that's what these numbers are showing us. And, and I wanna make sure that you all understand how important that is so that we can use this as a first step. So you know what diversity is in your context and maybe it is gender that is your focus because that's where your biggest gap is. Maybe it's ethnicity or, or one of the other dimensions, but you've defined it and you know that you need to start immediately. There is no waiting. The waiting actually accrues that diversity debt. 
and you know where to start. You need to start at the top, but like how, you know? And so here I say, you know, you should start with the hiring. We just talked about that um, and be really intentional about it, right? So, but you can't stop there. Um, So hiring is the first part. We want to invite people in um, and we want to, you know, make sure that people feel like we're open to it uh, and that we want a diverse team and that we have a diverse team. So that's why the leadership team being diverse also, by the way, is really important as you grow, because a lot of us look at the companies and what they look like to see if we want to join them. I know that I do that, right? So um, inclusive companies are 1.7 times more likely to be innovative leaders in their market. And two thirds of job seekers consider diversity an important factor. So, so this matters, what you look like to the outside world also matters from a recruiting perspective. The language you use when you post jobs, like how complex and how long the requirements are for, for um, your job listings matter. Um, some may not be aware, but this is a this is also a hard truth. So women, if we see a job description, and I, I've fallen prey to this so I can speak to it, it is very real, um, this, this stigma. If we see a job description with 10 requirements for that job, and we only meet nine of them, I mean, nine out of 10, that's a pretty large amount that we've covered. If we only meet nine of them, um, we won't apply. We will not apply to that job. But a man, if they see like one or two out of 10 that they have, they'll be like, oh, cool, I can do this and they'll apply. So we have to be careful about what we put out there knowing that. And I'm telling you openly, that is a very hard truth, but it is the truth. And I've had other women tell me they do the same thing. We just, we undervalue ourselves and we look at that and we're like, oh, we have to tick all the boxes or we can't apply possibly. We, we, should, we wouldn't be a good fit. Um, which a side note on fit, um, our head of people here at Adaptation educated me quite um intimately around like the term cultural fit. Um, and, and it's interesting, like I would actually challenge you all to remove it from your language because we have, and it's been a huge, I would say mindset shift, um, really important one in the, in the journey of diversity and inclusion. And so what we say now is cultural ad. Um, so our, is that person a cultural addition to our team? Um, because fit assumes that they fit a particular mold or they fit into your existing culture, which isn't necessarily what you want, right? You want difference. You want diversity of thought. You want someone that's going to challenge you. Um, You don't want them to be carbon copies of the rest of your team. So just a little takeaway there, again, to all of the audience today, regardless of your role or your context, instead of saying fit, like, oh, that person's not a good fit or that person is a good fit, think about them as an addition to your team. How would they complement your existing team or how do they add something that's maybe even in contradiction of your team, like something that that is an opposing um, opinion, right? So so I challenge you to think about that um, just an aside. But so with hiring, we have to look at our language. Our language matters. Um, there's a gender decoder here um, that you can see the link to here. Check it out. There's lots of different types of decoders that can look through your language or your job, job descriptions. This just happens to be one we use. Specifically, again, acknowledging one dimension of diversity for gender. There are others out there. Someone recently told me there's others out there you can actually purchase um, that will actually look for racial language as well in your job descriptions. These wor- words matter. Um, they matter a lot. And what we see is um, <laughs> this was kind of a surprise to us. So when we use these gender decoders on some very simple job descriptions, our job descriptions are pretty short and succinct. And we try to keep them open because as startups, you're really focused on product market fit. You're focused on generating revenue. Um, but, you know, you don't want to pigeonhole someone in a role when you're pulling them in because you know that when you're inviting them as a startup specifically, um, their role could shift, right? So we keep our job descriptions pretty light. And what really was surprising was even though they were light, they were riddled with masculine language. Our language, um, especially here in the U.S., I think is primarily leads mas- with masculinity. Um, and so we went through this and we actually saw direct results. Um, so this works. Um, and I've had other people also try this in their organization and strip some what was masculine language and they did see more women apply to roles. So there's there's proven results um, that I've seen directly and I have heard anecdotally, but definitely check that out because it does matter. So that will help you invite them in. And so the other thing that we do here is we use something, uh, sort of our own definition of the Rooney rule. So I recommend you checking out the Rooney rule. But really what what it comes down to is making sure that when you get to the second stage of interviewing, as you're hiring, going in through that process, that you're about 50% diverse. 
And so again, that's based on qualifications and diversity. So that might mean that maybe there's what you might have perceived in the first round, a little bit of a less qualified candidate compared to someone else, but you've kept them because you're giving them more of a chance to establish who they are, their identity, as well as maybe some things that might surprise you. And I'll tell you that, again, through through studies, but our own experience as well, that who you end up hiring can sometimes be those people that you would have not necessarily pulled through had you not been really intentional about doing this. So being intentional matters. Um, a lot of times, I think it's like, the, it's about maybe 58% of the time, the people that you've kept in that second round that end up, represent some dimension of diversity. And that's why you've kept them in there um, because they did have qualifications, but you also wanted to ensure you had a diverse pool of candidates. Those are the people that you end up hiring because they end up being the best candidates. So again, it, it may surprise you a little bit to learn, but if you have, if you are intentional about that, the outcomes are great um, and the benefits are huge, right? So there's huge benefits um, to doing that. And then dialing back, you apply the same hiring practice to leadership, like I mentioned, but intentionally, not tokenized. Um, and it's sad to say because startups, again, specifically dialing it back to, to our experience um, with startups, they are so focused on product market fit and generating revenue for obvious reasons. Only about 26% of them actually make deliberate efforts to diversify leadership. So, and that, again, where should you start? You've got to start at the top. So if you don't make, aren't making a deliberate effort, that's kind of a small percentage. So we're trying to change that. Um, our goal is to try to change that so that we see more and more. I mean, ultimately, right, the, the Nirvana would be 100%, but we want to see more and more startups really taking intentional and deliberate efforts to diversify leadership because then it naturally um, transcends to the direction of the company. But again, like the rest of the hiring and, and growth for the company. So huge benefits there. So check out decoders in general. This one is the one we use, for example, but I know there are others out there. It's really worthwhile and it's such an easy thing to do. Um, it takes such minimal effort and it has a huge impact on how you're presenting who you are and what you're looking for to the outside world when you're trying to recruit people um, so that you don't lose people at the door and not even realize, right? You, they dropped off when they read your, your job ad and you didn't even know. So that's, that's what we're trying to avoid here. Um, but you can't stop at the hiring practice. You know, you can't stop. I mentioned earlier, inclusive companies are 1.7 more likely to be innovative leaders in their market. I mean, that's, again, that's not a small amount that's almost two times more likely to be an innovative leader. So that, what is that saying? That's saying that, and again, you, you heard me say inclusive companies, right? You didn't hear me say diverse teams. You didn't hear me say um, companies like the 26% that make a deliberate effort to, to recruit. That's not um, what I'm talking about here because I think we often invite people in, but then we don't create an environment that makes them feel welcome or, or that they belong. So the ch what is the challenge there? The challenge is that they will leave. Um, so, you know, I talk a lot about user adoption, which is really a tight parallel to, you know, recruiting and inclusion and diversity. And part of that is adoption. So like the recruiting aspect, like getting people in the door takes intentional effort. It takes a focus. But if you don't maintain that focus throughout the entire journey, right? then you lose the retention side of things, which means people will leave because they won't feel comfortable. They won't feel challenged. They won't feel like they're being heard. Um, they won't feel as though their opinion matters, you know, especially with, again, back to age as a dimension of diversity. A lot of startups are made up of younger people. That's, you know, that's a bit of a stereotype that I'm throwing out there, but it also has data behind it. Um, part, why is that? This is an interesting fact um, because, the older we get, the less risk tolerant a lot of us are. Again, that's quite a stereotype, but I think also true. And I represent that in the less risk tolerant you are, the less likely you're going to join a startup because there's a lot of risk, right? So there's some uncertainty and unknowns. So joining a startup later in life can um, represent risk that maybe you don't want to take on um, because you have an established family, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that means that some of the people in the team are, are younger and just the, you know, the next generation of people, like they really want to be part of something that transcends them. They really want to leave their mark on society. Um, and so if you're not inviting them to the table and, and engaging with them and listening to their opinion, you don't have to agree with it, right? You don't have to like take everything that your entire team is saying 
and act on it explicitly and, and do what they're saying. But, but what you do have to listen and you do have to hear them and you do have to invite people to have a voice. So I like to say, be curious and invite challenge. What, what am I saying there? I'm saying like part of inclusion, it represents all of us just making sure that people have an opportunity to share their opinion, to be able to say, um, you know, Susie, I haven't heard you talk in this meeting. What's your, what do you think? What are your thoughts on this topic? You know, it's, it's in, inviting diverse perspectives and it's hard. Um, you know, I've told you a lot of the benefits. I've, I've thrown some figures up there. You know, there's another one around um, diverse teams have 35% better performance than non-diverse teams. And that could be both that gender and race. Um, that's where we measure, obviously, primarily a lot of our stats come from. Um, so there's so much data. So you might be saying, well, why wouldn't people just do this? Melissa, this is crazy. It clearly has business impacts. It shows better revenue, better return on investment for, for people investing in smaller companies, better performance. You know, what? there's so much upside. Why wouldn't people be more intentional about this? Um, well, part of it is, like I mentioned, because once you're well-established, it becomes even more difficult to introduce diversity and try to diversify your team. Um, but also because it is just harder. So from a leadership perspective, and I can speak this up leading teams, you know, for, for several years of different sizes and different dimensions of diversity, um, it is much harder to lead a team of diverse individuals, all the different dimensions um, included, than to lead a homogeneous team of people. Um, why? Why is that harder as a manager to do that? Because there's a lot more challenge and conflict. Now I'm telling you invite challenge. So I'm obviously not shying away from challenge here and, and we'll get into why that is, but it's harder. So people don't like to do those things that are hard. We like to represent and um, surround ourselves with people that are like us um, because being comfortable is where we as humans wanna be. Um, so we, we gravitate towards that, that comfort and surrounding ourselves with people that agree with us. I once had, it's an interesting story. I had a CEO of a local startup here, a reasonable sized startup at that time. I think there were upwards of almost 50 people. And he called me one day because he had met me through you no know, networking at several events and all the um, volunteering that I was doing around um, tech women in that space. Um, and he was a tech, it was a tech company that he was a CEO of. And he said, Melissa, I need your help. And I said, oh, geez, you know, what's wrong? And he said, well, I'm sitting around a table of all my leadership team. Um, going back to the need to diversify leadership, right? He's sitting around the table and he said, we're having these conversations around like our, our product roadmap and our strategy and, and you know, what we need to do next and also who we need to hire to support those, those outcomes. Um, I said, great. And he's like, yeah, but we're all agreeing with each other. He said, I'm looking around the table and it's like carbon copies of myself and we're all nodding. Nobody's, there's no conflict. Nobody's challenging anybody. Nobody's even asking, you know, questions to inspire a discussion. Um, and he said, this has got to change. There's like not, no creativity is coming out of this. Like we're, we're going to stall as a company. And I was like, well, first of all, congratulations, because a lot of people don't even recognize that. And um, that is a huge thing, right? Like I told you, defining up front where the gaps are and what diversity means in your context is step one. So he was at step one. Um, and we did help him and we incorporated some of the mentoring programs and things like that. And he was able to hire female leadership and, you know, it's, they diversified their company quite a bit. So it's recognizing that, but, but like he said, like they were sitting around a table and the leadership team looks all the same and they're nodding at each other because that's what happens. So um, someone referred to this recently in a podcast I did, they called it group think. And I was like, yeah, that's perfect. That's exactly what it is, right? It's that phenomenon of when, people all share the same opinion around a, a table and they're having discussion. One person says something and then the next person agrees and then it's sort of like a, a domino effect and everyone's agreeing. What I wanna tell you is that not, not, no great innovation comes from that. Um, great innovation comes from disruption um, and disruption comes from challenge and conflict. So we have to have opposing opinions. We have to disagree um, to get to the right outcome because my idea is definitely not gonna be the best or the most innovative idea in the room, but gosh, a combination of diverse per perspectives can certainly elicit such an amazing idea, right? Like a much better um, product comes out of that um, than if it's just a bunch of people around the table that look like each other. Um, I, I sort of really reject the term like-minded 
um, because of that exact fact. When I, when I think of like-minded, I think of that homogeneous group of people just nodding at each other and agreeing and nothing great coming out of that. So it is hard, right? That's, that's why people don't do it. Um, that's why there is such a lack of diversity at the top. That's why industries such as tech, but it's, it's, you know, spans multiple industries, lack diversity. Um, it's because it's hard, it's hard to incorporate. It's hard to do if you don't start on day one. So there are disadvantages and those are the disadvantages, right? It just makes it harder um, on the day to day because you will experience that challenge. But I, I I thrive in that environment and I recommend that you start to embrace it. Um, so think about the last time you were really uncomfortable and ask yourself why, you know, and, and those types of things. Be really, really curious and always be open to other people's opinion so that you might change your own perspective. And that's what when we say, you know, diversify thinking clearly is all about diversity of thought. And so we're always trying to inspire people to think differently. Um, because when you think differently, what's the next thing that, that logically happens? You act differently. So definitely like there's a lot of benefits of doing this, but it doesn't, you don't have to be in a leadership role. Like that's, again, I can't say that enough. Um, you can be curious and invite challenge from any seat at the table. It's really just as simple as looking around the room and making sure everybody's being represented. Are you getting feedback from everybody in the conversation? And think about the last meeting you were in, even you know now that we've been remote first um, through the pandemic, think about the last Zoom you were on and the faces you saw, how many people stayed muted and didn't talk or maybe you weren't even on camera, right? So start to be more aware of those things and invite people in, invite people to the conversation because people that want to work in that diverse environment are going to want this to stay in that diverse environment. And so you, you may get that sort of recruiting adoption phase, but you won't get retention. And that's what inclusion is all about. And that's why I want to invite you to invite challenge and really stay in that place of curiosity long enough so that people feel like they're part of it. And then, you know, now you've defined it, you understand you need to start immediately. You know that, you know, you've got to start at the top. You have to diversify leadership. Only 26% of uh, startups today are, are making a deliberate effort to do that. Don't, you know, be like them. Make sure that you focus on it more, but know where you are. So how do you define diversity? Remember I said, you need to understand your gaps. So where are you today? Be real about that. How diverse are you based on your definition of diversity? Write it down. I can't stress it enough. Writing it down gives you the power to change it because now you're holding yourself accountable. Accountability is all part of this as well. Make it part of your plan. Start to pay attention of trends in your business. And I mean that across your team. So when, what do I mean? Like think about the last five people you hired. Do they match that diversity definition that you wrote down in step one? Or are you even paying attention to that in your hiring practices? You know, it's going to highlight where you have work to do. Pay attention to the last five people, 10 people that you promoted. How diverse were they? You know, where did they come from? What was their background? Pay attention to the last 10 people that left. That this is a really important one, right? It's back to the inclusion side. How welcome did they feel? Did they feel like they belonged in your company, in your team, whatever your context is? And so were there, was there a pattern to the last five people that left your company? And what was that pattern and what can you do to change it? That's what's going to highlight, you know, and, and some of these are hard. Again, they're hard truths to look at on paper um, because you may have to admit things aren't working. Uh, but I promise you, if you spend the time doing that, the, there is a liquid benefit. There is revenue and um, operational cost benefit on the other side of that. Losing people is hard. So you don't want to have people leave because it's it's expensive to hire people, right? So pay attention to that. Watch for those trends. And then, you know, like just to, to go over, you know, real quick again, like define it. I think I've been super clear, like make sure it's really clear and you write it down. Start now so that you don't accrue that diversity debt because the more debt you have, we all know it's hard to go back and clean that up. Um, think about technical debt in your mind if you ever have doubts. And if you've ever experienced that, you know what I'm saying is true. Start at the top. This, this makes a big difference. It sets the tone for the future of your, your company, the future of your hiring practices, what your customers see. Are you relatable to a wider market? It could impact your business. Like what market is attracted to you? What customers are you attracting? Um, start with hiring, but don't stop there. Make sure that you're inviting people to challenge you. Um, I once told a leader that was 
moving on from our organization, he said, what advice do you have for me? Which I thought was such an amazing question for him to ask at like a C-level position at the time. And I said, surround yourself with people that disagree with you because he was such a bold and like firm speaker that I found people agreed with him a lot because they were a bit intimidated by him. And so I recommended that he surround people that disagree with him so that he would have that challenge and that diversity of thought. And then finally, know your stats, like write those things down, know where you're starting from along with the definition of diversity. So you can identify the gaps and you'll know when you've made improvements or when things are falling behind and you need to make adjustments, but you won't know if you don't track those things. So you need to measure those things so that they, they change. And then finally, again, Melissa Jerkwoys, um, always happy to have conversations about diversity and technology. Um, feel free to take a snap on my link tree. You can find me at all the different places, social and otherwise. And this was a pleasure. And I hope everybody had at least one great takeaway to think differently after today. Thank you so much, Melissa. So interesting. <clears throat> we have a question here from them from Constanza. She's asking how to deal with microaggressions, uh, male chauvinism, in the work environment when as women, it's not our job to educate men. Mm, I, that's such a great question. And I love, I love the addition of that she added of as women, it's not our responsibility to educate men. I'm actually going to challenge you because of course, here I am talking about inviting challenge, but I'm going to challenge you that I think it is partly our responsibility to educate men. Um, so, and I know, I know some of the, the things that can happen and in some cases I'll always defer and say you should bring, if you have any sort of HR, I know in startups specifically, sometimes we don't, um, so that can be tough, but if you do have HR, um, definitely regroup and bring them into the conversation. If you don't, in either way, you, you definitely, I do believe it is our responsibility to educate men. So you may not like that answer, um, but I'll tell you, because what I found more often than not is they don't even realize that what they're doing is having the impact on us that it is. Um, and, you know, I have so many examples. I'm trying to think of a quick one, but I have so many examples of where I've, I've brought it to the attention of male leaders in, in my organization when there's been a certain scenario, like leaving me out of conversations, right? Conversations where I should definitely be in, right? Like if my role is related to customers and you're having a direct conversation with customers and you're not bringing me into the conversation or you're kind of going around me, to me, that's it's sort of like implying that I'm not doing my job or I can't handle it because that person's a male and you're a male and you're just going to take care of it. Like very boys club. That's kind of a thing we say here in the U.S., right? Um, but but now I could look at that and say it's not my responsibility to educate him that he shouldn't have done that. But I actually took the whole other role where I sat down with him and said, listen, when you do this, this is how this makes me feel. And this is honestly, this is a systemic problem that I've been dealing with for 25 years of my career. And I believe, like I so I have this phrase, I say, assume good intent. That doesn't mean that everyone has good intent, by the way, but I like to lead with assuming it. And so I said, I'm assuming that that, that is not, that was not your intent, was to make me feel as though I wasn't doing my job or that I couldn't handle it because I was a woman and that you were going to take care of it. But when, you know, he thought he was just doing me a favor and I said, you're doing me a favor is actually undermining my authority. So I need you to bring me into those conversations. Like, am, is this my role? Yes, it's your role. Okay, great. Then you need to bring me into those conversations. You can't go out and around me. So that's an example. Again, I have lots of examples. That's one that's sort of fresh in my mind. So I would say, it, I kind of feel like it was my responsibility because I don't think that he really intentionally was doing something that was a form of like microaggression against myself as a female leader, but it certainly felt, I mean, I was furious. So I certainly felt that way, right? Like I felt, really offended. And there's been moments like that. Or another example is I was on a call again with customers and I find myself being the only female in the room quite often, right? Like both on the, cause we work with tech companies, we're a tech company. So it, it's the reality of, of my role. Um, and someone, one of them, one of the men said something that was, I believe somewhat inappropriate. I would say, I don't believe it was a very professional, uh, adjective. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Um, in response to, something that he said, my CEO reiterated that same word back. Now he didn't know that that was like really offensive. I was the only woman on the call. I followed up with him after I said, Hey, I just want you to know, I want to talk to you about something that happened on that call. Like that was not cool. Like that, 
he said that was not cool but the fact that you said it back to him in response to something like you were agreeing with him was even worse and he was like oh i didn't take it like that i took it like and he said this whole thing i go yeah just so you know as a woman in that room there was no other way to take that <laughs> like even he, like there was just no other way to interpret that it was completely inappropriate and like i need you to be aware of those things i don't need you to call the guy out like we don't need to embarrass people you know whether it was intentional or not on his side but i definitely don't need you to like validate it <laughs> by repeating it so again like maybe not the right answer for you or, or what you wanted to hear, but I would say, you know, we have a responsibility. Um, and, and, and so the gender diversity dimension that I represent in technology, I have a responsibility so that other women don't feel the same aggressions or, you know, inappropriateness in the future, right? And so I'm not gonna fix a systemic problem, but I can certainly do my part in my context. And so, I guess I'm challenging you to say you you do have your a responsibility um, to speak up because we can't assume that they know that they're doing something that's inappropriate. It's a it is like a societal bias, and I don't think we can hold every individual accountable and say they're a bad person because they did that. Now that's not to say there aren't some people that are very intentionally um, inappropriate, but I think we should assume good intent and try our best to do our part. And then ultimately, if it's within your workplace and you can't. You don't have HR or they're not helping. And, you know, I think that's a whole nother conversation where it's probably not the right environment for you. But um, that would be, would be a little bit of challenge in that advice or answer to your question. Well, I think it was a great question. She's uh, clapping her hands here in, in our <laughs> chat. So she's very happy with your answer. Great. Um, I think it, it comes a little bit back to what we talked to the, to the speaker before you. I think sometimes men, we think so differently men and women. Mm -hmm. And sometimes... I see it with my husband. I've known him for almost 20 years and we still don't understand each other always. Yeah. We think so differently and from yeah. completely different uh, angles. So sometimes something that's totally logical for me, it's not logical for him yeah. or other man perhaps. And they say things that they have no idea is offensive. So I think you're right that it, we have to educate somehow or at least open our mouths and say, you know what? I didn't like the way you said that. Yes. So please think about how you speak or what you say. And this was not fun for me. Um, I think it's, um, but we don't want to be, uh, you know, we don't want to be hysterical as women. So maybe yeah. sometimes we don't really say it when we get offended because we don't want them to to see us as hysterical, perhaps. Mm. The other thing we could think. Yeah. So I think it's 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 a point and in this very male dominated area of work, uh, I think it's important that perhaps women know how to actually react. Maybe some good advice is how do I react if I'm in this situation and this guy says something in front of 20 other guys and I feel really offended. How could I react in that situation? Not to be the cry girl, you know, not mm -hmm. to be uh, what would be a, like a good reaction if I feel really offended or that, you know, they, I mean, they may be even here in, in Latin America, it's a little quite male chauvinistic still. So they might even comment maybe your clothes or your or your look. How do you confront that if, if you feel really uncomfortable? And how do you sort of draw the limit to, you know, I'm also a person, I'm a woman, yeah outside yeah. this uh, office i'm a woman and we can be friends and you can flirt with me perhaps but not in the meeting room perhaps you know how yeah. do you how do you create that limit um in order to be respected and not to, for them to think that you're just hysterical and or whatever <laughs> yeah yeah we do i mean there's a you know there's a lot of mental gymnastics that we go through is what i like to call it um and i actually heard a man on a panel once and so it was really enlightening for me right i think it's more about like understand and be understood because you're right like we don't we have such different ways of thinking men and women um and i agree with what you were saying like even with your husband that you've been with right like there's just certain you're like that's what you would have thought like how could you have thought that but it but i think it, you know I, that's the great thing right like that's what brings people together is the differences so you know this this man on this panel said he said it's a struggle to be and i was like what it's a struggle for you as a man of technology sure right like you're in a leadership role like boo hoo like i don't feel bad for you but you know what he said was really enlightening to me and he and it challenged me to think differently about what they go through as well like he's like you know a woman walks in a room and you know, there's not any, ch the chairs are full. Do I get up and give her my chair? Mm. Because is she going to get offended? Like, 
oh, I'm a woman. So you have to get up and get my chair. Would you have done that if a guy walked in? He's like, or am I being offensive because I don't give her up, give her my chair? Do I hold the door for her? Do I not hold the door for her? And so I said, in my to myself, oh my goodness, they are going kind of through these mental gymnastics too, similar to us. Like, why would someone just say that? They wouldn't have said that if I was a guy. Like, so we're all going through this. And so sometimes it's like, wow, maybe the easiest thing would be just to ask, <laughs> just to ask, you know? Um, so in that sense to him, it's like, maybe he should just say, would you like a chair? Like, it's just polite, right? It's not even about men or women. And maybe you just ask a guy that too. Like when he walks in the room, would you like a chair? I, I'm happy to get up if you would prefer to sit, you know, and just kind of treating people just well, <laughs> politely. Um, but to that point, I've have experienced my fair share of like strange comments that I know wouldn't have been said if I was male in the room and like weird things. I even had someone, I worked for, for a company that, you know, their headquartered was in France. And so one of my French colleagues, I was in a meeting full of men all around the table in a boardroom. And um, I was the only female <laughs> and he wanted to do introductions. Um, and so he, he said, let's start with the woman. And I was like, why would, would you say, nice. <laughs> why would you say that? And then I had to like, again, kind of give him the benefit of the doubt and be like, okay, he's being polite, but it was like, really? <laughs> like, could you, could you have not said, let's start with Melissa or like, um, let's start at this end of the table, but let's start with the woman. And it was just really awkward. Um, so it, it definitely happens. And in that case, like, I didn't call him out for it. So I think it really does depend. I think there's there's some aspects of if you call them out, are you acting too feminist? Like, am I standing up on the table and burning my bra in front of everybody? And everyone's like, oh, geez, be careful with her. She's really emotional. And you kind of draw too much attention to yourself that way. And it's it, it stinks because we we go through that in our head. Um, we want to be taken seriously. We want to be respected. We want to be seen as like strong and mature. But we are women and we should also be proud of that. And we should be able to wear a very pretty dress and not have someone make some sort of slang comment to us and we walk in the room and, you know, and make us feel uncomfortable. So what I found in my own experience, and this has taken years to get to this stage, a lot of the times I said nothing um, and I would let it kind of like eat away at me sort of in a resentful way um, that didn't serve me. So I think, again, I, I try to lead with assumed good intent when I kind of think, did they actually mean that in the way that I took it? Or did they, it's sort of an innocuous comment. They didn't actually mean anything by it. And I think back to that man on that panel where he's like, do I pull out the chair? Do I hold the door? I don't know what to do. Am I going to offend her? And I'm like, maybe that's going on. And they, they, you know, it's tough. They're stumbling on their words. They're not sure to say the wrong thing, the right thing. And this happens, you know, it's a big part of diversity and inclusion too, right? That people are really, really, paralyzed by their language it's it's big with race and, and all kinds of dimensions of diversity um i'm so I'm, I'm so afraid i'm gonna say the wrong thing i say nothing um mm. and so sometimes i'm like it's okay you're gonna make mistakes it's okay and so i don't think we want to take an approach where we crucify men for making those mistakes because then i think we're gonna make it worse um so but i do think if we have a good relationship with people and we should that it let's not make a spectacle of them in front of a room of other people because maybe they didn't mean to do that but maybe take them aside after right and say hey listen i know similar to what i've done you know recently with with my leadership team it's like hey listen i know that you didn't you weren't intentionally trying to make me feel uncomfortable but when you said this this is how that felt um so i just want i want to make you aware of how that made me feel and i would appreciate in like professional contexts that you don't sh you know openly voice your compliments about what I'm wearing today, you know, or something like that. And just be professional about it instead of taking it so personally. I think we do, um, we do take things really personally. I, and listen, I suffer from it too. My first reaction is, excuse me, but <laughs> I have to like say to myself, okay, assume good intent. Like they probably, you know, and we don't know their background either, right? Like maybe they were raised if, if a woman comes in the room and she's dressed nice, you should always compliment her. You don't know, right? And so like, they're not trying to make everybody look at you because you're the only woman in the room. But you know, then I've also had stories early in my career where I had a VP during an architectural presentation I was giving early in my twenties, comment on the color of my nail polish. Well, that was just a, you know, <laughs> inappropriate, <laughs> thing, right? Yeah, and so 
But I will say, I look back on that moment. That was one of the defining moments in my career as a moment where I didn't speak up. You know, the room got dead silent. No one said anything. I was the only woman in the room. I was the one presenting. It was really awkward. And then I just started talking again. So it was so do you like, think they realized that that was out of line? Do you think the others sort of realized it? I think, I think everyone was just really uncomfortable, but no one wanted to call him out. I certainly was so intimidated in that moment that I didn't, um, but I'll never forget that moment. It's crazy the things that stick with you. I will never forget that moment, how I felt, the silence in the room, like the whole thing. Um, and I look back now and reflect on it as, you know, I was a confident, intelligent, young woman in a room full, in a boardroom full of older men in, in director and VP roles. And I think I intimidated him because I was speaking about things in a technical perspective that he didn't have knowledge of. And so I think in that moment, again, my reflection of that is he was trying to kind of like level set, <laughs> like, okay, everybody just remember she's a woman, right? Like check out our nail polish. because like, we're listening to her right now, but like, he, I think he felt intimidated. So, so again, like I, I get a horrible thing to do, but at the same time, I try to have some sort of empathy for, What was he in that moment thinking, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, why would he say something like that? And so I think that's the other thing going back to like trying to stay in that moment, that place of curiosity and inquisitiveness. Um, it, it, I didn't do this, but I wish now going back that I could have took him aside after the meeting and said, why would you have done that? Hmm. Like, what would have made you do something like that in the middle of me giving a professional presentation? you know, and like really pushed it back on him. So he wouldn't, he would think about that and not, never do that again, you know, or, or understand the impact it had on me in the moment. Um, of course, hindsight's 2020, but then I just try to like, you know, be more vocal now. So, but it is, it's not easy and it, it will, you, we think, oh, we're so far progressed as a society that stuff doesn't happen now. It happens. It happens all the time. It still happens. I have another question here from Tammy. Maybe maybe we have talked a little bit about it. But she says, in which way can we compete in this masculine um, area? No, not area. Um, oh, it costs a lot uh, to get a job. And it, 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 it costs, yeah, it costs a lot like to, to get a job if you're fighting from, you know, going against the, um, the stream. What do you call it? The, oh, my language. Um, Like if you're going against everything they're doing, it's very yeah. hard to obtain a, a job perhaps. How do you, do you have an advice for that? A piece of advice for that? Yeah. So kind of like going against the status quo, so to speak. And like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's tough. Like I think um, you don't want to assimilate, right? Like you don't want to just become like everyone else to fit in. Like we don't want to fit. We want to be a good addition. We don't want to be a fit. Um so that's a really big question. <laughs> how, how do you find a job? I think, well, A, you know, I meant I think perhaps she's thinking about how do you escalate? I mean, how do you keep getting promoted if you mm. kind of fight all the time against the way things are done? I mean, it's again this, perhaps this thing of being respected as a professional. How do you manage that situation that trying to educate, but at the same time, Uh, not wanting to be against everything all the time. I think yeah. that's the, yeah. where this question is going. Yeah, no, that that's fair. That, I think, thank you for the clarification. I think I, my advice is find a sponsor. And when I say sponsor, um, we often think of like someone to mentor us. Um, if you can find a male sponsor, like somebody that you can align with, that you respect, mm -hmm. they will help you overcome a lot of these things. Um, that, that definitely was something that was huge for me in my career. Um, I didn't know that's what was happening at the time, but now on the other side of that, I look back and I'm like, oh, geez, he sponsored me for quite a bit of my career. And when I say sponsor, different than a mentor, right? This is a person that um, is going to promote you when you're not in the room, like to other people. Like this is the person that's talking about the great work that you're doing. It's it it allows and let's be let's face it, the majority of people in leadership roles, right? It's the reason why we're so passionate about this. Are male. Um, they are primarily white males. Um, they're even most uh, between the ages of 50 and 60, I think. So like there's a specific demographic that represents a lot of the executives um, across the industry and specifically in the tech industry. So, um, you know, find 
if you can find someone in a leadership role that you do respect that you can align with, they will help you as far as like, how do you continue to maintain authenticity, right? Like, because you don't want to sacrifice your authenticity for a job, like in no case. Um, So that will never work because at some point you will be miserable, if not immediately, because you're not going to be true to who you are. So it is a bit like swimming upstream. I think that's kind of what you're you're going like going against the status upstream, quo. Upstream, that was yeah, the best yeah. word. I couldn't find the word. <laughs> no, I totally get you. I think, but look look for someone that will help you, right? Like that will take you with them. Um, and so that's that's when we refer to sponsors, which is um, it's it's a really interesting dynamic and a relationship. It's different than a mentor because it's not just about them giving you advice. Um, but it's about them really supporting you in your career and pushing you through, pushing you up and elevating you to be promoted. Um, and I think that because there are so many, so many men in leadership roles, we've got to align ourselves with them. And I promise you, there are people out there that are that want to support you. But again, like ask for help, but don't 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 assume they know you need help. I think that's the other thing. Like we as women are like, well, why would they help us? Or well, they're not helping us. Well, but they don't even know. Well, like I just like back to the first question, like don't assume that they know what they're doing is making you feel bad. Don't assume that they know that you need help. So I recommend like seek out somebody in your organization that you do have respect for, that you feel comfortable having a conversation like that with and, and talk about the things that you're challenged with. Talk about what your aspirations are. And I think inevitably you will align yourself with someone that will sponsor you and and help lift you up while still maintaining like your own authenticity. I think that's, that's crucial. Otherwise, you know, you sacrifice that and you're not going to feel good about anything that happens to elevate your career. Mm. The last question from, from Lydia, what would be three pieces of advice to make a work plan uh, that would get us to the, the goal that was um, uh, spoken about in this talk? Three like you have a boom, 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 plan, sort of how to like diversify your team, like kind of like what would be the three things that you take away from this? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think number one is, like I said, probably more than you wanted to hear, but like define it and write it down. Like what what is the most important thing from diversity? Because I think we as women, we always think gender because it's top of mind to us. But like, is that what it is? Um, so number one, like be re- super crystal clear about what it is, the outcome that you're trying to reach. Is it 50-50 gender diverse? Um, is it that you want more women in leadership? Is it that you want more ethnicity in your organization? What is that? Um, number two, um, look at how you're, ha- A, how are you inviting people into your organization? Like, what are you doing? What, how do you represent your team, your company publicly? because that is going to change who will come to you. Um, So that's a huge thing to look at once you understand what your goals are. Um, And then finally, are you creating an environment that is truly inclusive? And that's when I'm saying like, be existentially curious, like every single day, all the time, always asking other people's opinions, always being open to that. You do not have to agree with it. Listening to other people's perspectives does not mean that you agree with it. It also doesn't mean you're going to act on it. But I think that's that's what inclusion really means. It's just inviting the opinions to the table and, and, and listening, allowing people to share, give feedback, um, feel like they belong. Like those three things I think would be the, the biggest takeaways from today. Thank you so much. It's been really, really interesting. We are, we're on time now. We have to stop because uh, we have the next um, panel coming up. But we want to thank you so much for your time. It was Welcome. great hearing uh, this talk, and uh, I think we got a lot of good pieces of advice to continue. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great summer. Yes, you too. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.